One Piece will never be real. The One Piece! The One Piece is real! Can we get much higher? So high. Yeah, so it's no secret that I'm uh, not too fond of live action adaptations. I just. I just don't think it's natural. I laid out my thoughts on the matter last year in this video and it was pretty well received. But recently there's been a shift in the discourse. This didn't age well. This aged poorly. You wrong. Well, well, well. But One Piece. One Piece did good. One Piece broke the curse. Does he know? One Piece ruined um, this video. Actually, you should do a follow up video. The One Piece! Following the release of Netflix's live action One Piece, this video saw an influx of viewers dropping by to tell me how the show debunks my entire argument. Any formerly valid point that I made, you can just go, nuh uh, and point to One Piece as it negates every single one. I'm definitely not alone in saying that this Netflix original was not something that I was looking forward to. Live action adaptations, be it for cartoons, anime, or video games, don't exactly have the best track record, especially not from Netflix. We've seen them fail repeatedly, and there was little indication that this would be any different. But the council has spoken, and this one's an exception. But is it actually? The One Piece community has built a reputation of having some of the biggest glazers of any fandom. Oh my god. Netflix butchering back-to-back live-action anime attempts? Nah, not my goat. One Piece will be different. And I hate to say it, but they might have been onto something. First, let me establish my relationship with the series. I was introduced to the One Piece anime through American television alongside shows like Naruto and Dragon Ball. This means I had the pleasure of experiencing the story not just through any dub, but the 4Kids dub. Being a dumb little kid, I was too naive to notice the egregious changes that were made and the minor ones that I picked up on, I would just shrug off. Huh, why is this guy's face always surrounded by smoke? That breath must be crazy. None of the censorship got in the way of my enjoyment at the time and I still have fond memories of it. One Piece is an anime that I grew up with, until I stopped growing up with it. I would eventually pivot to watching the anime subbed and getting some 300 episodes deep before falling off the series. Years later, I picked it back up, got to Alabasta, and dropped it again. One Piece just wasn't for me. All this to say that I am not a One Piece fan but I'm familiar with the early arcs and know about later events through cultural osmosis. I went into the Netflix series with relatively little love for the source material and even less love for live action adaptations. That being said, I liked it. Yeah, it's, it's good. From the very first episode, it's clearly evident that there's something that sets One Piece apart from its live action contemporaries. And by the second, I'd already decided that this is the best live action anime I've seen. Competition's not stiff, but hey, I mean, it's something. The casting is phenomenal. I look at every actor, look at the original character and go, yeah, that, that looks about right. Even the minor ones. I don't know where they pull these guys out of, but keep them coming for season two. Except for this guy, he, he can go. Of course, the actors aren't all one for one perfect copies. I mean, they're real people, but they get pretty damn close. And when the show does take a bit more liberty with how some characters are represented, it's not to its detriment. You know that meme where it's like manga, anime, Netflix adaptation, and the last one is like a 70 year old black woman because diversity or whatever? This is a Netflix adaptation without the Netflix adaptation stereotypes. I mean, it still does have some race and gender swaps, but nothing that comes off as inauthentic or untrue to the source material. The world of One Piece is massive and filled with all kinds of eccentric characters. A ninja with a head about as big as his whole body. And uh, w whatever this is, One Piece does not discriminate. In a Q&A, One Piece author Eiichiro Oda once replied to a fan asking what nationality each straw hat would be. He said that Luffy is Brazilian, Zoro is Japanese. Nami is Swedish, Sanji is French, and Usopp is from Africa, the country of Africa, my favorite nation. This is a group of misfits from different corners of the world brought together by similar goals. It's a given that any real world adaptation is going to end up looking like a UN meeting. The most notable change is probably with Nami's adoptive sister, Nojiko, who got substantially more melanated. This still works since a major theme in Nami's arc is found family. None of these people are related. If the rainbow hair didn't give it away, that skin tone will. They don't need to share blood to call each other family. The writers don't feel the need to hit you over the head with this and don't even really bring attention to it. The show isn't automatically better for this casting, but it's definitely not something that hurts it. A majority of the filming took place in South Africa, so it makes sense for them to cast local talents in roles where it'd be appropriate. 
Honestly, I'm kind of surprised the casting got no backlash and all anime fans were able to act like normal, rational individuals. The different accents also go a long way in selling you on this expansive world. The characters all sound wildly different from each other because of course they would. The world of One Piece isn't even entirely mapped. They're sure as hell not gonna have a uniform way of speaking. All the actors gave extremely strong performances. Inyaki Godoy is Luffy. He embodies that cheerful, happy-go-lucky disposition that the character is known for without falling into bebop territory. Wake up! I have a job for you! We have to find Velazio, Velazio, Velazio before he does spooky bad things. Luffy's weird. He's a weirdo. He doesn't fit in. I don't want to fit in. Have you ever seen me without this stupid hat on? That's weird. But Inyaki still makes the character work. But I'm gonna be honest with you. By the 15th, become king of the pirates! A shotgun barrel was looking kind of tasty. The line did get a bit grating. Taz Skyler maintained Sanji's perpetual horniness without it being obnoxious. Jacob Romero made me actually like Usopp. Makenyu Zoro still hates minorities. I kill your kind for a living. Makenyu's performance is one that I think doesn't hit quite as hard as his co-stars. He plays the character in a very deadpan, edgy swordsman fashion with constant vocal fry and minimal emotion. Zoro, what you gonna wear? Something black. How edgy. Disgusting black creatures. Don't get me wrong, Zoro in the anime does have a bit of edgelord in him, but he's not nearly this dry. We don't even see Netflix Zoro do so much as crack a smile till we're about halfway through the season. I'd imagine this is more so a product of the writing and direction rather than McKenyu being a poor actor. Whenever he's doing badass swordsman shit, he definitely delivers. As the show's most well-paid actor and the one with the most experience in live-action anime, you would expect him to understand the assignment. Granted, those other adaptations were not all hits. One Piece definitely is. So what is it? What, what is that special sauce that makes this show stand out from the others? How does it avoid every single pitfall faced by its predecessors? It doesn't. A whole lot of that shit is still here in One Piece. The costuming is extremely faithful. Everything looks pristine. To a fault. This isn't a problem for the costumes that are just a t-shirt and some shorts, but for the more unconventional outfits, they come out looking like cosplay. There's this filter they use to try and give things a weathered look, but it just makes everything look really gray. Also, some of these wigs are criminal. Sensei, please give me the honor of allowing me to carry Queen of Sword. Why should I allow you to carry it? Because I'm a fucking main character, bro. Look at me. Look at my hair color. Look at your hair color. Look at everyone else's hair color. You think they even get names? Yeah, they still got that thing where an important character standing in a crowd of normal people sticks out like a sore thumb, and it's only exacerbated by being in live action. An effort was made to darken the hair colors to make them look more natural, but green hair is still green hair. The action scenes hit more than they miss. While the fight choreography is solid, the hits sometimes lack impact, with the wire work having characters straight up levitate, and some attacks just clearly not connecting with their target. And Luffy's gum gum? Man, I'm, I'm sorry, but those effects look every bit as uncanny as I thought they would. Same goes for Buggy's devil fruit and Kuro's fancy footwork. Like I said in my first video, some things just do not work with real life actors. Although I've spent most of this video praising the show, this is still something that I firmly believe. One Piece didn't succeed because it dodged every obstacle anime adaptations face, but because it understood its place as a live action series and did its best to cleverly work around things that the medium can't do justice. Japanese live action anime typically changes little to nothing when adapting characters. No matter how goofy something looks, they're gonna keep it in. American productions tend to change so much that the end product is unrecognizable. This is somewhere in the middle. The One Piece showrunners acknowledge the limitations of the art form they're adapting to and figured out how to best work within those confines. Inyaki captures the essence of Luffy's character, yes, but his performance is still heavily dialed back from how he is in the source material. They chose to forego physical traits like Usopp's nose and Sanji's eyebrows to better ground the designs of the main cast in reality. But a minor character like Nezumi is allowed to walk around with whiskers on his face because this is still the world of One Piece and we got people who look like this. Zoro's three sword style is something that absolutely has to be included in any faithful adaptation. So it was, but anytime he's actually fighting, the third sword takes a back seat 
and it's mostly for show, cause they know and we know that having him deflect blows with his teeth would have looked absurd. They have only characters with certain personalities announce the names of their moves, so when they do it, it doesn't break your immersion. Oh, great fighters call out their finishing moves. Yeah, you're gonna fit in just fine. Countless compromises had to be made to make the show feel real. Entire characters were sidelined because, well, how the hell are you gonna adapt this? But for major characters that they couldn't cut out, they did what they could to varying levels of success. Arlong was a character that I wondered for the longest time how they were gonna handle. Turns out they decided, let's just make him a nigga. For the longest time, there's been discourse around the parallels between fishmen and black people. Netflix went, fuck it, let's just make that shit canon. I audibly laughed out loud when Arlong pulled up to Baratier and the usual swashbuckling tunes stopped and they started playing that Lil Uzi Vert type beat. It's not just that the actor is black. Everything from his dialogue to his delivery evokes a sense of blackness. They even had my mans double up on the gold chains. Does it surprise you that I have intelligence? Ambition? Usage beyond manual labor for humans? Ayo? And enslave my people. Slavery has been abolished. But your prejudice remains. Hey, yo. I want to point out that the writer and executive producer, Matt Owens, is black. So I'm sure none of this went over his head. Also, I don't really have a problem with any of this. I just think it's hella funny. In One Piece, larger than life characters are literally made to be larger than life. Garp and Axehan Morgan stand over nine feet tall. Both of these characters are still very human though, so not much is lost by their more grounded portrayals in the show. When it comes to major villains, having them tower over the heroes is a simple yet effective way to convey how much of a threat this new enemy is, and Oda does this constantly. Arlong is the biggest villains the Straw Hats have faced up to this point, both literally and figuratively. But rather than being this massive imposing figure, he ends up feeling like just a guy. I mean, he's a decently tall guy, but he's still just some guy, like an average crook. They could have gone the Thanos route with motion capture and CGI, but I can't imagine that being cost effective, and this is already not a cheap production. Each episode of One Piece cost $18 million, and that's with all the concessions made to tone down the more fantastical elements. This show is at its absolute best when the characters are talking, bouncing off of each other, or just sitting down and chopping it up. The chemistry that the actors have with each other is off the charts, and the showrunners know to play to those strengths. It's why the whole B-plot with Garp was more of just that, compelling dialogue with likable characters. They pay homage to iconic scenes from the anime without having the typical shonen fare always center stage. Strong character interactions are the backbone of this series. It's a very different take on the story that maintains the same broad strokes. Changes had to be made for the show to be even watchable. But of course, not all changes are going to go over well. Live action characters will never emote with the same expressiveness as animated ones. Their fights will never have the same level of fluidity or grandiosity. Animation isn't bound by the laws of physics or even common sense. What can be done is to write with these obstacles in mind. Minimize the elements that don't work. Focus on the parts that live action excels at. Buggy's decapitated head may look like something straight out of Spy Kids 3D, but these characters are so compelling, I allow it. Real life gum gum techniques look absurd, but it's on the screen so infrequently that it's not too much of an issue. Even so, this first arc is the most grounded in reality that the story is going to get. One Piece only gets more weird and wacky from here on, and it'll be extremely difficult to tone down without losing too much of the source material. I'm insanely curious to see how they dance around live action limitations in the coming seasons. Everybody's worried about how they're going to handle Chopper. I'm just thinking, how the hell are they going to adapt any human who's eaten a zone devil fruit? Or if they even make it to characters like Big Mom and Gecko Moria? How? Did Netflix's One Piece break the live action curse? No. Fictional stories will always lend themselves to a particular medium, and this Looney Tunes ass series is right at home in animation and manga. Even with the most talented team, certain things just don't translate well. What it did do is set a new standard. A bunch of adaptations have already been announced, and after the success of this one, we're going to be seeing a hell of a lot more, and I think most, if not all of them, will still be dog shit. Netflix's One Piece is an exception, not the norm. 
We've already had some decent works based on anime, but we didn't suddenly see an influx of high quality live action anime following these films. The curse lives on, but we got a solid barometer by which to judge upcoming projects, because the bar used to be beneath the floor. Whether studios actually learn from this show and change their approach remains to be seen, but I'm not holding my breath, and I don't think you should either. For One Piece though, I'm hyped to see what they do in the next season. If you haven't seen the show, what are you doing watching my video? Go watch it. it it's only eight episodes and wait, you weren't going to go watch all that without any protection, were you? It's dangerous out there. Here, take this. NordVPN is an essential tool for anybody who frequently browses the internet, which at this point is everybody, especially you, my fellow anime enjoyer. I know what you are. I know what your search history looks like. But you know who doesn't need to know is your internet service provider, your school, your employer, or anybody trying to peek in on your internet usage. Nord lets you browse the web without any prying eyes being able to see which websites you're connecting to. Want to access content that's not available in your country? Just use NordVPN to pretend you're in a different one. One click of a button and, oi bruv, I'm from Tottenham. If you want to watch that one anime that's only available in Japan, Daijoubu, just connect to that server and you're good to go. Right now, Nord has a special offer, where if you get the two-year plan, you get four additional months on the house. Use my link, nordvpn.com slash nasuvpn, or just click the link in the description. Not feeling the product? That's fine. Nord has a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you can try it risk-free. Thanks for watching, and thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring the video.